I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit, and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death, but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we seek out patterns that occur in the biblical text and extrapolate them into applicable principles. Here on the backside of the wilderness, the text of the book of Numbers returns to the style in which the book began. At the beginning, there were discussions of census and movements and an addressing of some of the finer points of dedication. The Levites were elevated to their position and the entire tabernacle and worship system, along with the entire governmental system, was put into place and readied for their trip to take the land. And when Israel began to move in their journeys, the style of the text shifted drastically. No longer dry and dusty lines of numbers and locations, now interesting stories of the people and their actions and reactions to the challenges that they faced along the way. And through the course of the narrative, a delay comes about. And these narrative portions that should have covered only a few weeks at most ended up covering a full 38 years and change. And it is only once Israel arrives at Shittim on the east side of the Jordan that the text then shifts back to how it began. Numbers and counts and finer points of various legal code. But as we've examined each of these sections, we have found seemingly random bits of legal code scattered throughout the book of Numbers. And in this, we have discovered something of value. These sections are not placed where they were by happenstance. There is an order to their placement. Each of these seemingly random sections of text addresses a theme that is under discussion. A flow of thought continues from beginning to end of each of the three sections of the book. And here at the end, this has not changed. In the beginning, the text was focused on preparations to move. Long or short, things needed to be accomplished. Organizations needed to be found, and hearts that did not like the changes that were being implemented needed to be addressed. In the center, it was the journey that dictated the theme, but the theme was not set by the journey. Instead, it was set by the hearts and actions of the people who were on the journey. For on the journey, their baser desires were brought forth. Their hard hearts were exposed. Their treachery and rebellion were made clear for all to see. And the law chapters served to address these challenges, to offer direction and comfort in some cases, to highlight things occurring in the background of the text in others, but every chapter in its place. And here, at the end, the text now shifts once again to preparation. This time, not preparation for a journey. This time, preparation for a conquest. Preparation to move into and to take up the land of inheritance that had been given to Israel. And it is this that is the overarching theme of this final portion of the book of Numbers. And as we have seen in the last two weeks, this is exactly what has been addressed. A census once again. This time not to instill honor into the warriors of Israel. These men have seen battle. They have seen victory. They know their place and their ability. They know Hashem fights for them. Rather, this time the census was taken for the purpose of inheritance land allotment and distribution according to the sizes of the tribes at the point of the second census. And as we continued last week, we saw this theme continued, the allotment of the land for all the tribes of Israel, the inheritance of Levi, the scattered tribe whose inheritance is Hashem alone, the inheritance for the daughters of Zelophehad, five women seeking to protect the name of their father, and the inheritance of the role of leader of Israel. Inheritance is indeed at the forefront of the minds of Israel as they prepare to take the land. This week, however, it would seem on the surface as if the text takes yet another schizophrenic shift to the festivals and sacrifice. 
As we approach these items, it's all too easy to focus on the obvious and to miss the underlying ideals. This chapter is not so much about festivals and sacrifice as it is about another type of inheritance. Hashem's portion of the inheritance of the land. You see, Hashem is intimately connected to Israel. He has tied his name to them. Their success is his success. And their failures, while not his failures, they do reflect poorly on him and his reputation among the nations. And so as Israel comes into the land and begins to contemplate thoughts of inheritance and bounty and gain, we find this chapter comes along to remind the people, you are not doing this on your own. You are not the ones who will benefit from this conquest. There are things that belong to Hashem. All of it belongs to Hashem, and when you get to your inheritance, you will remember this. There are not only items, there are times. All are His, but He wants some of it back. So with this in mind, let's turn to Numbers 28 and read both chapters 28 and 29. Numbers chapter 28 and 29. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, Take heed to bring my offering, my food for my offering made by fire as a sweet fragrance to me at their appointed time. And you shall say to them, This is the offering made by fire which you bring to Hashem, two male lambs a year old, perfect ones, daily, a continual ascending offering. The one lamb you prepare in the morning and the other lamb you prepare between the evenings, with one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with one-fourth of a hen of pressed oil a continual ascending offering, which was offered at Mount Sinai for sweet fragrance, an offering made by fire to Hashem, and its drink offering, one-fourth of a hen for each lamb. Pour out the drink to Hashem as an offering in the holy place, and the other lamb you prepare between the evenings. As the morning grain offering and its drink offering, you prepare it as an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem. And on the Sabbath day, two lambs a year old, perfect ones, and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour, as a grain offering mixed with oil and its drink offering. The ascending offering for every Sabbath, besides the continual ascending offering with its drink offering. And on the beginnings of your new moons, you bring near an ascending offering to Hashem. Two young bulls and one ram and seven lambs a year old, perfect one. Three tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil for each bull. Two tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil for the one ram, and one tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering for each lamb, as an ascending offering of sweet fragrance, an offering made by fire to Hashem. And the drink offering is half a hen of wine for a bull, and one third of a hen for a ram, and one fourth of a hen for a lamb. This is the ascending offering for each new moon throughout the new moons of the year. And one male goat and a sin offering to Hashem is prepared besides the continual ascending offering and its drink offering. And in the first new moon, on the fourteenth day, is the Pesach of Hashem. And on the fifteenth day of this new moon is a festival. For seven days unleavened bread is eaten. On the first day is a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And you shall bring near an offering made by fire as an ascending offering to Hashem. Two young bulls and one ram, and seven lambs a year old. Perfect ones they are for you. And their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil. Prepare three-tenths of an ephah for a bull, and two-tenths for a ram. Prepare one-tenth of an ephah for each of the seven lambs, and one goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. Prepare these besides the ascending offering of the morning, which is for a continual ascending offering. According to these, you are to prepare the food of the offering made by fire daily for seven days as a sweet fragrance to Hashem. It is prepared besides the continual ascending offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And on the day of the first fruits, when you bring your new grain offering to Hashem at your festival of Shavuot, you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And you shall bring near an ascending offering as a sweet fragrance to Hashem, two young bulls, one ram, and seven lambs a year old, with their grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for each bull, two-tenths for the one ram one-tenth for each of the seven lambs, one male goat to make atonement for you. Perfect ones they are for you. Prepare them with their drink offerings besides the continual ascending offering with its grain offering. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. It is a Yom Teruah for you. And you shall prepare an ascending offering as a sweet fragrance to Hashem. 
one young bull, one ram, seven lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, and two-tenths for the ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs, and one male goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. Besides the ascending offering with its grain offering for the new moon, the continual ascending offering with its grain offering, and their drink offerings according to the right ruling, as a sweet fragrance, an offering made by fire to Hashem. And on the tenth day of the seventh new moon, you have a set-apart gathering, and you shall afflict your beings. You do no work, and you shall bring near an ascending offering to Hashem, a sweet fragrance, one young bull, one ram, seven lambs a year old, perfect ones they are for you, and their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, two-tenths for the one ram, one-tenth for each of the seven lambs, one male goat as a sin offering besides the sin offering for atonement, the continual ascending offering with its grain offerings and their drink offerings. And on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a set-apart gathering, you do no servile work, and you shall celebrate a festival to Hashem seven days. And you shall bring near an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem. Thirteen young bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones they are. And their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for each of the thirteen bulls, two-tenths for each of the two rams, and one-tenth for each of the fourteen lambs. And one male goat is a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. Then on the second day, twelve young bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering and their drink offering for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs, by their number, according to the right ruling. And one male goat as a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering with its grain offering and their drink offerings. And on the third day, eleven bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering and their drink offerings for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs, by their number, according to the right ruling. And one goat as a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering and its drink offering. Then on the fourth day, ten bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering and their drink offerings for the bulls, and for the rams, and for the lambs, by their number, according to the right ruling. And one male goat as a sin offering, besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering, and its drink offerings. Then on the fifth day, nine bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering, and their drink offering for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs, by their number according to the right ruling. And one goat as a sin offering, besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. Then on the sixth day, eight bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering, and their drink offering, for the bulls, for the rams, for the lambs, by their number, according to the right ruling. And one goat as a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. Then on the seventh day, seven bulls, two rams, fourteen lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering, and their drink offering, for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs, by their number, according to the right ruling. And one goat as a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. On the eighth day you have an assembly, and you do no servile work. And you shall bring near an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Hashem. One bull, one ram, seven lambs a year old, perfect ones. Their grain offering and their drink offerings for the bull, for the ram, for the lambs by their number, according to the right ruling. And one goat as a sin offering besides the continual ascending offering, its grain offering and its drink offering. These you prepare to Hashem at your appointed times, besides their vowed offerings and your voluntary offerings as your sending offerings and your grain offerings and your drink offerings and your peace offerings. And Moshe spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Hashem had commanded Moshe. Many lessons ago, I spoke on what we should do when we encounter repetition in the course of the biblical text. Because all too often we encounter something that is repeated in the Bible, and it is too easy to just roll our eyes at this outdated and ancient text and their silly use of repetition. What's that? The instructions for the tabernacle are being repeated near verbatim? Skip it. Oh goodness, yet another description of the ordination of the priests. Blah, move on. Just how many censuses need to be recorded in one book? No matter, just what's next? And we skip over these matters without considering their purpose, why these things might be repeated. Our modern minds demand entertainment, and repetition is, by its very nature, not entertaining. Add to this that there are many chapters in the Torah that are not applicable to modern audiences, when a topic doesn't directly apply to us, once again, the tendency is to just skip it. Sacrifice? 
We simply cannot accomplish sacrifice as it's described in the Torah, so why bother reading about it? Zarot? Uh, leprosy? Well, I'm not a doctor, and this affliction has either passed away into the annals of history, or it's a placeholder term that describes an entire host of maladies that we know of today. Regardless, I don't have Zarot, and I don't know of anyone else who does, so skip. And the list continues on and on. And so when we encounter chapters such as the current Parsha, we find here a double whammy of uninteresting text. This chapter describes actions that we cannot take because sacrifice cannot be accomplished without a temple. And this text is repetitive, and that repetition occurs on multiple levels. It is repetitive internally, as each section bears the same bits about hints of wine and oils and, and ephahs of flour that are to accompany each of the sacrifices described. Over and over we read this throughout these chapters. And all of this is repetitive externally as well. Just 13 chapters ago, we read about the amounts of each of these things that were to accompany each type of sacrifice. None of this is new information. Added to this, these chapters contain a listing of each of the festivals of Hashem that are to be celebrated in Israel, the days that mark the various times and seasons that make up the year for Israel. And so we find that this chapter is repetitive on several levels and contains instructions that bore because of non-applicability. But added on top of this, it seems as if this chapter acts as a web of sorts that binds together several other chapters without much, if any, really new information. I mean, the only really new information that's contained in this chapter is the number and type of each of the various sacrifices that are to be brought on each of these Moedim. Big deal, right? This doesn't apply to us. But as I taught so long ago, when you discover repetition... Look to the differences to find the reason for the repeat. And when you find non-applicability, look to the themes under discussion in the text, both self-contained in the chapter and in the larger scope of the context of the chapter, book, section, and the entire Bible itself to discover what they hold for you, for us. So let's once again go through an exercise of using these tools that we have been employing over the last several years and that have served us well so far. And this time we get to compile multiple tools together and use them all at once. So when we open this chapter, we do find something that bears some interest and is unique in all of Scripture. These two chapters alone provide a complete listing of how time works according to Hashem. It begins with days then proceeds to weeks, which culminate in the Sabbath. Then it moves on to months. It's only after these that it transitions into the yearly times of importance. And this chapter provides the basis for the measurement of time. And believe it or not, this was new to Israel in their experience, as not a single person in Israel who came out of Egypt measured time anything like this. They likely measured time the way that the Egyptians measured time. When in Rome and all that, you know. As we look into history, we discover that ancient Egypt had 10-day weeks known as Declans, and they had three weeks in a month. Their calendar was a purely solar calendar with no lunar aspects to be found. There were three seasons in Egypt. Each was split into a four-month, 120-day cycle for a total of 360 days in a year. At the end of the year, at the time of the change to a new year, there was a five-day month that was interposed at this time, and it was celebrated as the holy days for various gods of theirs. This five-day period was seen to occur outside of the normal monthly cycle. Ten-day weeks, three weeks in a month, every month exactly 30 days, a five-day month that occurred outside the course of the year. If we look at it closely, the ancient Egyptian calendar is very similar in ways to the Enoch calendar. It's one of the reasons that I do not accept the Enoch calendar in any way. Now, we know that this calendar that was in effect when Israel was enslaved in Egypt, as this calendar did not fall out of use until Egypt was forced to adopt the Ptolemaic calendar after it was conquered by Alexander the Great in the 4th century B.C long after Israel came out of Egypt. And contrary to modern conception, not every society has always followed the conventions of this calendar as laid out here in the pages of Scripture. 
with its seven-day week. But we all do today. And yet there are no societies today that follow the layout of the months and the years as a mix of solar and lunar, as understood by ancient Israel, except those who follow the Jewish calendar in one form or another. Nearly every society has a purely solar way of accounting for years. Usually they end up with 365 days a year, such as the Gregorian calendar that we use today. Or they implement a purely lunar calendar, such as is employed in Muslim nations. The Hebrew calendar is unique in this aspect of accounting for years, but the foundation of our seven-day week is sourced squarely in the description of the creation. It cannot be found anywhere else, and it cannot be found even by examining the way the world works. It only finds its source in the Creator. Regardless, while this is interesting, there's not a whole lot to take from that other than a recognition that not all societies throughout history have conformed to the seven-day week. In this, we find a subliminal recognition of the validity of the Bible and its account of creation. And this is one of the reasons that the institution of the Sabbath was such a huge part of Israel coming out of Egypt. Before this, they were working 10 days a week, with there being some possibility of there being a two-day weekend break in the course of this 10 days. But the timing of when this convention arose is under some disagreement, and whether Israel ever had the opportunity to take a break at all, well, that's simply not known. Now, moving on, as the chapter opens, Hashem steeps the commands of this chapter in the language of my food to describe the offerings that are to be brought at each of these times. Now, this has caused all sorts of problems, as it has caused many modern detractors of the Bible to point to this as proof that Israel thought that they were feeding God with sacrifices, and that without these sacrifices, Hashem just simply wouldn't have any sustenance. But that is not what's being described here. Hashem does not need to eat as humans do. Hashem does not need to eat as pagan gods were thought to have the need to eat. And this misconception is clarified later in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 50, verses 8 through 13. It says, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices and your sending offerings are continually before me. I do not take a bull from your house nor goats out of your pens, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and all moving in my field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not speak to you, for the world is mine and all that fills it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? It's saying here that you indeed do bring your daily sacrifice, and I don't reprove you for this. But don't think for a moment that you're feeding me or that I need it, the psalm says. I don't eat flesh or drink blood. And when you give me the animals of sacrifice, it's not because I'm taking them from you. It's mine in the first place. It was simply put into your possession for a time until you return it to me when I ask for it. Now, this unfortunate understanding of what sacrifice is and what it accomplished needs to be understood. When you sacrifice something to God, it's not because he is taking it from you, and it is not him asking for it out of need. Sacrifice is a recognition that the item being given is his already. And it's an action that conforms to this reality. And sacrifice is an act of humility before Hashem. It says, I know that you supply all my needs, and so I can give freely of whatever you ask of me, and I know that it will be okay. This is such an important mindset for the people of God to integrate into themselves. But I can tell you from my experience that it's also a mindset that's not easy to adopt. Fear says, but I might need this tomorrow. In fact, I might even need this later today. I can't give it up. Desire says, but if I don't have this, then I might not be as comfortable as I would otherwise. Power says, but without this, I'll be weak and I'll be vulnerable. And shame says, if I don't have all this stuff, no one will respect me. I might not even respect myself if I give up this and our flesh rebels at the idea of sacrifice. For now, let's move through each of these sacrifices and examine each one in some small detail, and then return to this much greater topic later. And the bit about food, 
It was simply a way of making the idea stick in the heart of man that this is indeed something that has to happen daily. And just as with food for humans, it's through these sacrifices that fellowship occurs. So the first of the sacrifices of time that's described is the daily sacrifice. Two yearling lambs a day to be offered as a sacrifice. Now, this is a sacrifice that we've encountered previously in Exodus 29, 38, and here we read of it again. One in the morning, one in the evening, every day. Every day. This sacrifice occurred every day, twice a day, rain or shine, weekday or Sabbath, new moon or festival. Every single day, two yearling lambs were to be given to Hashem as an Olah. And beside this offering of a yearling lamb comes the accoutrements that we read of earlier in Numbers for a lamb sacrifice. A tenth of an ephah flour, a quarter hen of pressed olive oil, a quarter hen of wine as a drink offering. Now this command is one that causes a contradiction in the Torah, especially when it comes to the Sabbath. Because work is not to be accomplished on the Sabbath, and yet these daily sacrifices are to be done on the Sabbath. And this contradiction is something that the ancients recognized and they wrestled with. In fact, it is this contradiction that Yeshua points to as the precedent that allowed his disciples to pick heads of grain from a field that they were passing through on the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 1-7 At that time Yeshua went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not right to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God and ate the showbread which was not right for him to eat, nor for those who were with him but only for the priests? Or did you not read in the Torah that on the Sabbath the priests in the holy place profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you, in this place there is one greater than the holy place, and if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not offering you would not have condemned the blameless. The priests profane the Sabbath by offering sacrifice on the Sabbath. And yet this profaning of the Sabbath does not incur guilt. Why? Once again, we find an example of Cal the Homer, this determining of the weightier matters of the law. The Torah is all applicable, every bit of it, but there do arise times when the commands of the Torah seem to contradict themselves. When we come across situations of this nature in our lives, it's up to us to determine the command that bears the most weight and to carry out that command. And in doing so correctly, we remain blameless. And what is the heavier command? Compassion, mercy, patience, grace, truth, loyalty to covenant, love, and justice. The command that comes the closest to these ideals will always be the one with the most weight. In the case of the disciples walking through a field, this means allowing them to eat some to satisfy their hunger. Forbidding this action simply because it's the Sabbath is rote obedience and it acts contrary to compassion and love. Or in the case of a man who is likely dead lying on the side of the road in the case of the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was compassion that was called for and not ritual purity that the Levite and the priest upheld as their higher calling. Compassion will always win out over rote obedience. And in the case of the daily sacrifice on the Sabbath, the daily wins out over the weekly. And in doing so, there is no blame or guilt. In this case, love Hashem your God and fellowship with Him comes before take a break. There are many who take the command to take a break and place it above the command for fellowship. But this example right here demonstrates that fellowship is the weightier command. So travel if you must on the Sabbath, but get into fellowship. Now from here on out, every sacrifice that we speak of will be on top of this daily sacrifice that occurs regardless of what else is going on that day. The next sacrifice is the one that we've already discussed. The Sabbath sacrifice. The Sabbath sacrifice is two more yearling lambs and their accoutrements. Now on the new moons, things ramp up quite a bit. 
The new moon sacrifice includes two bulls, one ram, seven lambs, along with the accompanying flower, oil, and drink that's associated with the animal that's being offered. With the sacrifice and onward, we find something else added to the mix. One male goat as a sin offering was to be brought alongside these other offerings to make atonement for you. You, the priests, or you, the the people, it's really not clear. After this, the text then shifts to the yearly sacrifices. The ones that go along with each of the Moedim. The first off is the Pesach. Now, Pesach on the 14th doesn't include any extra sacrifices other than the daily and the Sabbath, if applicable. And then all of the Passover lambs for the entire nation. Then beginning on the first day of matzah and continuing on for seven days, there is a list of animals that are to be offered, and it is the same for all the rest of the spring festivals. Up next is Shavuot. Now with Shavuot, we find something interesting in the text. The holiday of Shavuot is called First Fruits or Bikurim. Now, for modern audiences, this seems odd since every messianic knows that Bikurim occurs during matzah. If we examine the text, the day that begins the count until the day of Shavuot, the day when the first fruits of the barley is waved in the temple or the tabernacle, is never called first fruits. It's only ever called the day of the chief wave offering. When we see the word Bikarim used in connection to the Moedim, it's always associated with Shavuot. Bikarim is never associated with the day that we call First Fruits Today, or Resurrection Sunday. Now, so far up to this point, each of the Moedim has been the same. There's no deviation from two bulls, one ram, seven lambs. But the festival of the seventh month brings a change to this. Both Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur prescribe one bull, one ram, and seven lambs. One fewer bull than the spring festivals. And both of these holidays include one male goat to be a sin offering as well. So on Yom Teruah, if it occurred on a Sabbath, as it was likely to do from time to time, there would be the daily sacrifice, the Sabbath sacrifice, the new moon sacrifice, and the festival sacrifice, all as simply the baseline of sacrifices for the continuing operation of the holy space. On Yom Kippur, however, we catch a glimpse of something else if we consider what was to happen to one of the sacrifices. On Yom Kippur, we are to afflict ourselves, and that can be demonstrated to mean fasting, among the avoidance of other pleasures. But on Yom Kippur, these food sacrifices are to be offered to Hashem anyway, and these sacrifices are to be added on top of the daily and Sabbath, if applicable, and atonement sacrifices of Leviticus 16. And among these sacrifices is a sin sacrifice a sacrifice in which the meat is to be eaten by the priests. What are we to make of this? Well, if we remember back to Leviticus 11, we saw something similar happen. During the first sacrifices of the tabernacle, two of Aaron's sons did something incorrectly and suffered the consequences. After this event, Aaron was not allowed to mourn for his sons. He had to continue offering the necessary sacrifices, or the tabernacle was finished before it had a chance to truly begin. And when Aaron got to the sin sacrifice, he did not eat of the sin sacrifice. He did not treat it as a sin sacrifice. He treated it as an Ola sacrifice. And yet the sacrifice was still accepted as a sin sacrifice. The sacrifice still made atonement for the people and removed the uncleanness of the people. And I believe that is what was to happen to the sin sacrifice on Yom Kippur. The thing that the sacrifice was to accomplish was accomplished. But in this case, there was a weightier matter at play that is stated as this section of text opens. Israel is to afflict their nefesh on this day. Even if the usual command is that the priests were to eat the sin sacrifice, On this day, the way to your command is the affliction of the nefesh. And then finally, to close out all of this, comes the sacrifices that were to be offering during the festival of Sukkot. Now, in this listing of sacrifices, we find something interesting. The number of bulls that is sacrificed each day over the course of seven-day festival. The first day it begins with 13, and by the seventh day, the number of bulls that are to be sacrificed falls to only seven. Each of the other sacrificial animals remains the same each day. Two rams, 14 lambs, one goat. 
Now, this should catch our attention. This passage is extremely repetitive, and yet throughout it, one word changes for each day, and that's the number of bulls to be offered. So what can we pull from this? Well, first off, let's look at when we find bulls used as sacrifices in the Torah. The first mention of a bull prescribed to be used as a sacrifice is found in Exodus 29. In this chapter, a bull is used to consecrate the priests as part of their ordination ceremony. So it isn't really helpful since it's part of a specific ceremony. So let's move on. The next mention of a bull is to be used in sacrifices in Leviticus 4, the chapter on sin sacrifice. And the first thing that we find is that when a priest sins, his sin is to be covered by a bull. All right, we're back to Exodus 29, and in my opinion, it's not super helpful. The next thing that we find in the chapter is that the bulls were also used to cleanse away national sins. So a bull can be used as a sacrifice for the entire nation as well as for an individual priest. And this is the only time that we find a bull specifically prescribed as the sacrificial animal for a cross-section of people other than the priests. So this deviation is curious, and I think it points to something deeper being revealed about Sukkot in this chapter. To discover where this leads, we need to ask another question. How many bulls total were on the docket for the week of Sukkot? Well, let's do some math. 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7. Punch those into the calculator, and what do you get? 70. 70 bulls. Some of you can already tell where I'm going here. A bull in a sacrifice can be used to represent an entire nation. And if we examine scripture, we find that 70 is the number that's used to represent the entirety of the nations of the world. And 70 is also used to describe the entirety of the nation of Israel. Now, for those who have done any study on the festivals of Sukkot, you know that it is known colloquially as the festival of the nations. And this idea comes from many places, one of the most explicit being found in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. And it shall be that all who are left from the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year and bow themselves to the king, Hashem of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. And it shall be that if any one of the clans of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to bow himself to the king, Hashem of hosts, on them there is to be no rain. And if the clan of Egypt does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague with which Hashem plagues the nations who do not come up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. We read here of a time still future when the nations will be required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem at Sukkot to pay homage to the king of the world, Hashem. And any nation that does not participate is to receive no rain for the following year. The beginning of the curses of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And we also read throughout the Torah that Sukkot is referred to as the festival of ingathering. Now, the ingathering of the physical and the literal is the ingathering of the fall harvest. But the symbol that is present in this is that this festival is a celebration of the ingathering of the nations to Hashem and to Israel. And with this, we can find in this chapter a pattern of time that is greater than the simple scope of a year. It is this chapter that gives us a basis for the plan of Hashem for the entirety of time. It begins with the individual as represented in the day. Every day, every individual is to offer themselves daily to Hashem. The bulls of their lips ascending before the Father, as Hosea 14.2 puts it. Hosea 14.1-2 O Israel, return to Hashem your God, for you have stumbled by your crookedness. Take words with you and return to Hashem. Say to him, Take away all crookedness and accept what is good, and we render the bulls of our lips. Our sacrifices of praise, as the author of Hebrew puts it. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice offering of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Next, it moves to our local community as the individuals or the days are gathered together into one to worship and celebrate on the Sabbath. Next comes the tribes as represented by the months. There are 12, or are there 13? 
groups of smaller communities all working and thinking alike. For us, this is a bit harder. We might think of this as uh, denominations, groups of people that are larger than an individual community and yet smaller than the entire nation of Israel or the body of believers in Messiah. And these describe Israel as the Bible describes it. Then come the yearly festivals, and these yearly festivals once again represent increasingly larger groups of people. The festival of Pesach, this festival definitely represents the nation of Israel. Exodus twelve forty three through 50 And Hashem said to Moses and Aaron, This is the law of the Pesach. No son of a stranger is to eat of it, but any servant a man has bought with silver. When you have circumcised him, then let him eat of it. A sojourner and a hired servant does not eat of it. It is eaten in one house. You are not to take any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to perform it. When the stranger sojourns with you and shall perform the Pesach to Hashem, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and perform it. And he shall be as a native of the land, but let no one circumcised eat of it. There is one Torah for the native born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Every tribe, every community, every individual of Israel gathered together to worship and no outsiders welcome at this celebration. Only those who are Israel or who have explicitly joined themselves to Israel. Next comes the festival of what? In the text, it's not initially Shavuot. Instead, it's known as the festival of first fruits. Not the day of the wave offering of the sheaf of barley, but the festival of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, baked into leaven loaves of bread and waved before the Father. And this festival celebrates the beginning of the inclusion of the nations into the people of God. Acts 2, 1 through 11. And when the day of the festival of Shavuot had come, they were all with one mind in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and settled on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them to speak. Now in Jerusalem there were dwelling Jews, dedicated men from every nation under the heaven. And when this sound came to be, the crowd came together and were confused, because every one of them heard him speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to each other, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how do we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and those dwelling in Aram the Harim, both Yehuda and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, both Phrygia and Pamphylia, Mitzrayim and parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the great deeds of God. The first fruits of the nation gathered together with Israel in an increasingly greater inclusion. And then in the fall feasts, we find that they all speak of the same thing in this regard. Yom Teruah, the advent of a king. Yom Kippur, the advent of a priest. And then Sukkot, the entirety of the nations gathered together as one behind this priest and king. The festivals describing the realms of influence in the human population that serve Hashem. And yet this chapter, they also describe the order of things in time. Consider it. It begins with an individual, Avram, symbolized by the day. Then comes a family or community, the patriarchs, symbolized by the week. Then come the twelve tribes, or is it thirteen? The sons of Jacob, symbolized by the months. Next, the nation of Israel in the Passover of Exodus 12. Then the first fruits of the nations in the festival of Shavuot in Acts 2. And that leaves events yet future. A king ascending to the throne, a priest making atonement in the temple, and finally the nations gathered together under one God, the God of creation, the God of Israel. A map for the ages of events of significant growth in the realms of those who worship Hashem. Now this is really cool, and suddenly this dry and empty passage, it becomes alive with meaning and potential. Israel indeed ready to take the land and enter into the place of promise. But it doesn't stop with Israel. The conquest is just another step in a much bigger picture and process that Hashem is doing in the earth. And that process begins with the individual. 
It begins with you. So let me ask you, what are you sacrificing for the kingdom of God? What have you given up to further the growth of this kingdom? Because that is what the symbolism of this chapter points to. This plan does not get accomplished without sacrifice, without giving of ourselves. But it was the priests who were to sacrifice, you might say. And what is it that we read in the New Testament in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 10? Drawing near to him a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice offerings acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. Because it is contained in the scriptures, see, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, chosen and precious, and he who believes on him shall by no means be put to shame. This preciousness then is for you who believe, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling, who stumble because they are disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for a possession, that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained compassion, but now obtained compassion. How many times have we heard people declare this promise, we are a chosen race and a royal priesthood and Messiah. But sacrifice? Giving of self? Giving up what belongs to me for the purpose of building the kingdom of God? Well, well, that's obviously someone else's job. That's not meant for me. I have goals and plans and bills to pay. Sacrifice to build the kingdom of God? And if we are priests, if this is a promise that we want to claim for ourselves, what does this mean for our inheritance? Everyone in the body is called to service. Everyone in the body is called to sacrifice. And yes, that means you too. Every person is called to sacrifice, and that sacrifice then moves up the chain and moves outward. And as it goes, it reaches the point where it's used to bring in the nations, to the point where it promotes new creation. And we are all called to take part in this. We're all called to give our lives in sacrifice. And when we do, only then can we be called disciples. And it's only by the sacrifice of ourselves and our time that we can continue on this path of life as we seek life. So Deresh Chai, Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we dare as we seek life. Shalom.